know this is Ben Television News Roundup, a compilation of major stories in the week ending. I am Vivian Elabo. African nations are expected to receive more than $17 million in investment from the just concluded U.S.-Africa summit hosted by U.S. President Barack Obama. The U.S. is also expected to spend more than $550 million in security development in what President Obama teamed as Africa Rapid Response Forces. More than 50 African countries, political and business leaders, were at the U.S.-Africa Business Summit to look at improving U.S.-Africa economic relationship, which has come under strong criticism under President Obama's administration. Ben TV's News Roundup looks at the, at the U.S.-Africa summit and its impact on Africa-U.S. relationship. Tonight we are making history, and it's an honor to have all of you here. You know, I stand before you as the President of the United States and a proud American. I also stand before you as the son of a man from Africa. The blood of Africa runs through our family, and so for us, the bonds between our countries, our continents, are deeply personal. Africa had expected a better and stronger relationship with the U.S. following Barack Obama's election as the first black president of the United States. The blow tie of the world's most powerful president to Africa was thought would work in favor of the African continent. However, Africa's economic relationship with the U.S. wasn't under President Barack Obama. Obama administration has been criticized for ignoring African economic potentials for too long to the detriment of the U.S., allowing China to build a stronger economic tie with Africa, with China currently making fortunes out of Africa with greater investment ties more than any Western nation. First is that he was attacked very sort of viciously during the 2008 campaign, um, sometimes by rumor, sometimes directly for having a father, a Muslim father, who was born in Kenya, in Africa. And he's sought politically to distance himself from that identity. This is an all-American president who happened to be black. And the second was that his whole sort of shtick as president in both election campaigns has been to wind down foreign wars, wind down foreign entanglements, and, and really pivot to America to focus on the problems at home after the Bush years. Um, and Africa is one of these big, long-term, strategic um, sort of zones of the world that deserves to be addressed, and he has paid as president lip service. In order to devise the worst economic situation between the U.S. and Africa, U.S. President Barack Obama has pledged the United States support for Africa's economic and industrial development at the just-concluded U.S.-Africa summit. President Obama will host well over 50 heads of state, prime ministers, heads of corporate institutions and intergovernment agencies. At the summit said it was time the U.S. took advantage of enormous African resources. So we are here, uh, of course, as part of the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit, the largest gathering any American president has ever hosted with African heads of state and government. And this summit reflects a perspective that has guided my approach to Africa as president. Even as Africa continues to face enormous challenges, even as too many Africans still endure poverty and conflict, hunger and disease, even as we work together to meet those challenges, we cannot lose sight of the new Africa that's emerging. We all know what makes Africa such an extraordinary opportunity some of the fastest growing economies in the world, a growing middle class, expanding sectors like manufacturing and retail, one of the fastest growing telecommunications markets in the world. More governments are reforming, attracting a record level of foreign investment. It is the youngest and fastest growing continent with young people that are full of dreams and ambition. You know, last year in uh, South Africa, uh, in Soweto, I held a town hall with young men and women from across the continent, including some who joined us by video from uh, Uganda. And one young Ugandan woman spoke for many Africans when she said to me, we are looking to the world for equal business partners and commitments, and not necessarily aid. 
We want to do business at home and be the ones to own our own markets. That's a sentiment we hear over and over again. When I was traveling throughout Africa last year, what I heard was the desire of Africans not just for aid, but for trade and development that actually helps nations grow and empowers Africans for the long term. African leaders have called for a deeper economic relationship with the United States, hailing investment pledges totaling more than $17 billion, about £10.7 billion, at the Washington summit as a first step in the right direction. President Obama reassured the African leaders of his administration's commitment to helping African states optimize their potentials through partnership with the U.S. As President, I made it clear that the United States is determined to be a partner in Africa's success, a good partner, an equal partner, and a partner for the long term. We don't look to Africa simply. We don't look to Africa simply for its natural resources. We recognize Africa for its greatest resource, which is its people and its talents and their potential. We don't simply want to extract minerals from the ground for our, our growth. We want to build genuine partnerships that create jobs and opportunity for all our peoples and that unleash the next era of African growth. That's the kind of partnership America offers. And since I took office, we've stepped up our efforts across the board. More investments in Africa, more trade missions like the one Penny led this year, and more support for U.S. exports. And I'm proud I'm proud that American exports to Africa have grown to record levels, supporting jobs in Africa and the United States, including a quarter of a million good American jobs. But here's the thing. That our entire trade with all of Africa is still only about equal to our trade with Brazil, one country. Of all the goods we export to the world, only about 1 percent goes to sub-Saharan Africa. So we've got a lot of work to do. We have to do better, much better. I want Africans buying more American products. I want Americans buying more African products. I know you do, too, and that's what you're doing here today. So I'm pleased that in conjunction with this forum, American companies are announcing major new deals in Africa. Blackstone will invest in African energy projects. Coca-Cola will partner with Africa to bring clean water to its communities. GE will help build African infrastructure. Marriott will build more hotels. All told, American companies, many with our trade assistance, are announcing new deals in clean energy, aviation, banking, and construction worth more than $14 billion spurring development across Africa and selling more goods stamped with that proud label made in America. And I don't want to just sustain this momentum. I want to up it. I want to, I want to up our game. The U.S. President also urged African officials to create conditions to support foreign investment and growth, highlighting its government strategies for actualizing economic relationship with Africa. So today I'm announcing a series of steps to take our trade with Africa to the next level. First, we're going to keep working to renew the African Growth and Opportunity Act and enhance it. We still do the vast majority of our trade with just three countries, South Africa, Nigeria, and Angola. It's still heavily weighted towards the energy sector. We need more Africans including women and small and medium-sized businesses getting their goods to market. And leaders in Congress, Democrats and Republicans, have said they want to move forward. So I'm optimistic we can work with Congress to renew and modernize AGOA before it expires, renew it for the long term. We need to get that done. Second, as part of our Doing Business in Africa campaign, we're going to do even more to help American companies compete. We'll put even more of our teams on the ground advocating on behalf of your companies. We're going to send even more trade missions. 
Today, we're announcing $7 billion in new financing to promote American exports to Africa. Earlier today, I signed an executive order to create a new President's Advisory Council of business leaders to help make sure we're doing every single thing we can to help you do business in Africa. And I would be remiss if I did not add that uh, House Republicans can help by reauthorizing the Export-Import Bank. That is the right thing to do. I was trying to explain to somebody that uh, if I've got a Ford dealership and the Toyota dealership is providing financing to anybody who walks in the dealership and I'm not, I'm going to lose business. It's pretty straightforward. We need to get that reauthorized. And you business leaders can help make clear that it is critical to U.S. business. Number three, we want to partner with Africa to build the infrastructure that economies need to flourish. And that starts with electricity, which most Africans still lack. And that's why last year, while traveling throughout the continent, I announced a bold initiative, Power Africa, to double access to electricity in sub-Saharan Africa and help bring electricity to more than 20 million African homes and businesses. African leaders said they were optimistic of becoming full partners in a relationship worth an estimated $85 billion a year in trade flows as U.S. business leaders hide opportunities in the region home to six of the world's 10 fastest growing economies. This uh, meeting will open up a new chapter of our relation in the sense that we anticipate the agreement that we have, the support that we have been receiving from, from the U.S., that will be enhanced, they will heighten that uh, uh, cooperation. And also, the, uh, this meeting and, of course, our discussion will enable to have new uh, platform of uh, cooperation. The African leaders this time around are more ready to avoid the mistakes they did before. And they have become more strongly energized with a lot of specific input in terms of negotiating stronger, credible partnerships. That's what they are looking for. They are not looking for aid. They are looking for trade and stronger partnerships. And that's what we are expecting. The United States has the technology and the capital in terms of money, as well as the skills that uh, the Africans want. The Africans are strong in that. They have a, a very uh, strong natural resource base a very strong and a dynamic human resource base, but also our people on the continent are becoming more educated, more skilled, more sophisticated. So we are talking about if you want a kind of an, uh, a working economic partnership between the United States and Africa to address all issues, social, economic, and peace and security issues at once. The U.S.-Africa summit is expected to the divine U.S.-African economic relationship and call it trade ties and foster greater opportunities between Africa and the U.S. as Russia suspends all food imports and exports from the U.S. and EU in retaliation for the sanctions against it. <music> And to the UK, where the economy has been recording positive outlook in the last one year, Ben Television Friskia Gobat conducted this report on the impact of the economic growth on cost of living. Official figures have confirmed that the UK economy has returned to the pre-recession level, ending with the longest downturn in the post-war history. So let's find out if there's a positive change in the UK economy after the financial crisis six years ago. Well, things are more expensive, yeah. definitely. Because when I first arrived here, the economy was really good. You know, standard of living wise, I thought it was pretty good. It's like every year things go up, and I yes. just think it should get to a certain amount of like, things should go up every year, it should be set at the target. You know, it should stay at that amount until it everything going up. It's like it just. The, um a recent change in uh, the impact in the economy in the country has been really uh, positive. Um, so much so that the um, new tech that we work for is called Newham Training Education Centre has increased its uh, its value to the to the community in that besides just owning the uh, training organisation, we have uh, three nurseries, a children's centre, and we now have the pop-up shop which you are present at at the moment. The thing is, uh, 
I haven't, I haven't really seen any change to my standard of living um, and I haven't really felt the impact of the country's growth. London is a problem, isn't it? Because it's overcrowded and then, like, what you've got to look about is like homeless people and like everybody trying to get somewhere to live and like the more people that come in, the less housing and then the balance, like the people living here you know, people that are living in the country, doesn't matter if they're from like any country or from the world, but like they come, that's good, they're safe. On the outbreak of Ebola virus disease in some West African countries, Nigeria has now recorded its second victim, the nurse who treated Mr. Patrick Sawyer, the Liberian man who died in Lagos after flying in from Liberia. The country has also declared eight suspected cases being held in isolation. The disease has so far killed more than 900 people in Africa countries of Liberia and Sierra Leone. Ben TV looks at this virus and efforts to contain it. Will we uh, look at any emerging threats uh, around the world that potentially have implications for the UK? Clearly this outbreak of this virus is a cause for concern. There may be British nationals in the area. We know that there's a lot of people travel from West Africa to the UK and vice versa. So it's sensible for us to meet together, to listen to what the experts have to say, to listen to their advice and then to decide uh, among ministerial colleagues what action, if any, we need to take to make sure we keep the UK safe. That there is a threat that has been identified which we need to respond to. Now, this is happening all the time. Terrorist um, threats from different parts of the world, disease threats, um, even economic threats that we look at, we evaluate, and we set out a sensible and proportionate response uh, to them, and that's what we will do today. I don't want to speculate on what those measures might be. I want to listen to the scientific evidence, get the advice of the experts about what we should do, look at the benefits that would flow from action and the costs that action uh, would impose in terms of any restrictions that it uh, imposes on what people uh, intend to do, and then um, make a rec proper, properly considered recommendation to the Prime Minister for the action that we should take. But we will do whatever we need to do to protect the UK from any risk that could arise from this outbreak. Um, I think uh, we now know that the man had Ebola. It's no more a suspicion. Um, clinically, the clinical picture depicted a viral hemorrhagic fever. And uh, carrying out testing, we were able to pick uh, a filovirus because we are sure of the primers that uh, we used. So only w what we are waiting for is to find out which of the Ebola virus, uh, which of the filoviruses. Is it Ebola virus? Is it Marburg virus? They are all equally deadly. So whichever way it is, we know the man is having a, a deadly viral infection. And um, from the brief uh, history, we learned that the man collapsed while coming out of the flight. Here in Nigeria. Here in Nigeria, before being rushed on the wheel to a, a facility. So from the part, that picture, the man had been incubating the virus. And only God knows how far the virus the particles had gone in the organs and the systems. But the following day, when they now started uh, looking at the picture, so they discovered that uh, it was progressing. Because uh, the second day of the admission, they noticed the uh, uh, hematuria, they noticed the uh, diarrhea, and diarrhea coupled with hematuria, they are two bad signs. And these are the signs that have been associated with uh, Ebola viral disease. This is a firm confirmation that we had the virus brought to us. I got to know Kent first when he introduced JPS, and then we have been very close over the last four years. He finished his residency and fellowship here in June of 2013, and then left last October for his assignment in Liberia. Um, Kent did the three-year family medicine residency and the, the year of, of fellowship in preparation for his departure. Kent accepted a, uh, an appointment with uh, Samaritan's Purse with World Medical Mission, a two-year postgraduate fellowship 
to prepare him for what he anticipates will be a career as a uh, medical missionary in underserved um, uh, communities in the majority world. Uh, Kent's assignment was to Liberia, and he has felt and continues to feel a deep calling to be in that place and to care for those people. I got off the phone with Kent about 30 minutes ago, and he told me that um, he wants everyone to understand that he knew when he went to, to Liberia that there were many diseases there for which there are no immunizations and for which there are no cures. He did not intentionally go into an area with Ebola. Ebola arrived in Liberia after the Brantleys arrived, and as the epidemic began to unfold, Kent found himself in a very difficult circumstance. He was asked by the hospital, Elwa Hospital, where he is serving in Monrovia, Liberia, to serve as the medical director of the isolation unit for Ebola. Uh, as you're aware, um, the attempts to contain the virus have not been successful as with past epidemics, uh, and so the virus is spreading in the capital, in Liberia. Uh, the hospital where Kent is working has worked very, very closely with all the authorities to develop a state-of-the-art isolation unit, which Kent directed. Um, Kent is confident that he followed all of the appropriate protocols and never breached protocols. Um, so the source of this infection is uncertain at this time, but he took uh, great care for himself and for um, the others under his supervision. From politics to economy, business, technology, the totality of what makes man, man is all going to get on this front. We we'll give you the information that you need business, to economy, to politics, to technology. And that's all we do here on this point. From the beginning to the end. And that is why we are here. Keep watching this point from the television. And today I'll be your host. This is all we have on News Roundup this week. Thank you for being part of it. I'm Vivian Elabos.